Hello, my name is Gustavo Ribeiro, Editor-in-Chief of the Brazilian Report. Today we're launching our Brazilian Constitution special podcast miniseries to celebrate the 30th anniversary of, well, of our Constitution. This podcast was produced by me and Diogo Rodrigues and was inspired by Constitutional, a podcast by the Washington Post. If you're a foreigner, a 30-year-old constitution might not sound like much, especially if you're an American. The U.S. Constitution, framed in 1789, is the oldest constitution still in use. But even if 30 years is not that much, heck, even I am older than the Constitution, these last three decades represent the longest ever period of democratic rule in Brazil. Since breaking from Portugal in 1822 and until 1888, Brazil has had seven constitutions, each with an average lifespan of around 27 years. 19 if you count only Republican constitutions. So blowing 30 candles should be significant for us Brazilians. And believe me, it was not easy to get here. Hoje, 5 de outubro de 1988, a Constituição, a nação mudou. The 80s were intense years for Brazil. Since being sworn into office in March 1979, General João Batista Figueiredo started carrying out a slow process of democratization in Brazil, a process that would be, until its very end, controlled by the military dictatorship. For 21 years, the military commanded an authoritarian regime that kidnapped, tortured, and killed political opponents, censored the press, and was marked by arbitrary decisions taken by its leaders. Figueiredo would eventually hand over power to a civilian in 1985, but the people would still not be able to choose their next president. Congress would be tasked with that, and chose Tancredo Neves, a conservative, mild-mannered man from Minas Gerais. He was one of the leaders of the popular movement for direct elections. While the people didn't choose Tancredo, it almost felt as it had. Vim para promover as mudanças, mudanças políticas, mudanças econômicas, mudanças sociais. That's him addressing Congress in 1985 and promising social, economic, political change. But Tancredo Neves would never take office. On the eve of his inauguration, the president-elect was rushed to the hospital with severe abdominal pain. It turned out to be a benign tumor, which Tancredo had ignored for months. Partially because he hated doctors, but also because he didn't want anything to get in the way of Brazil's return to democracy. But for 39 days, the president was in the hospital, his vice president was the acting head of state, and no one knew exactly what was wrong with Tancredo. On April 22, 1985, Brazil woke up to a bombshell. The president was dead. Lamento informar que o excelentíssimo senhor presidente da República, Tancredo de Almeida Neves, faleceu esta noite no Instituto do Coração às 10 horas e 23 minutos. The circumstances surrounding Tancredo's death were subject to many conspiracy theories because of the timing and the secrecy around his condition. It didn't help that his VP turned president, José Sarney, was a supporter of the dictatorship. So at this point, Brazil was 0 for 2. It didn't have direct elections for president, and the civilian people liked ended up dying before taking office. To make matters worse, Brazil was amid a huge foreign debt crisis, and inflation was at 80% a month. Yes, a month. So it was in this situation that Brazilian lawmakers got together in Congress to draft a new constitution for the country. What could go wrong? Four months into taking office, then-President José Sarney sent a bill to Congress to create a National Constituent Assembly, which would be formed by the lawmakers elected in 1986. And despite all of our problems, Brazilians were happy. A new constitution would be definitively bearing our authoritarian past. Brazil is a country at that moment that uh, uh, strangely combined an incredible amount of optimism with a huge uh, economic crisis. 
This is Pedro Abdamovay, a former National Secretary of Justice and Director of the Open Society Foundations in Latin America and the Caribbean. With 487 representatives and 72 senators, the National Constituent Assembly began work in February 1987, and for the first time in Brazilian history, Congress would draft and enact a constitution from scratch. No previous document was served as the foundation of this new Charter of Rights. So, every member of Congress wanted to get his or her own stamp on the final text. Every single topic was intensely debated, and sometimes disagreements scaled into fistfights. Growing pains for a Congress that would be forced into reaching compromises after being neutered for over two decades. It was the first time that in 25 years that the Congress was interacting uh, among themselves, right? Because the Congress before was just obeying what the, the, the president and the administration was saying. So for the first time, even inside the conservatives uh, groups, they had to deal with the fact that they had to bargain, right? They, they had to negotiate, that they had to be open uh, to this uh, democratic uh, uh, bargain, I would say. And that's... And I think that the, the outcome was quite positive at the, at, at the end. It was agreed that the National Constituent Assembly would operate in 24 subcommittees dedicated to specific themes, such as what would be Brazil's system of government, or environmental laws, or labor laws, or human rights. Brasilia, the isolated capital in the middle of the country, suddenly became the meeting point for lobbyists, social movements, associations, and indigenous organizations, many of which camped outside of the Congress building. The Brazilian people were finally the protagonist through movements both from the countryside and urban centers. That was pivotal for the Constitution to be so advanced in terms of human rights. In order to pressure lawmakers into voting for more labor rights, unions played a pivotal role. They spread billboards around the country with photos of the members of Congress who had voted against workers' demands. In each state, voters were aware of what their representatives were doing. This oversight was key for the approval of such fundamental rights as the right to strike, the reduction of the working week from 48 to 44 hours, and paid vacations. After all, 1988 was an election year, and no one running for office wanted to be seen as a member of the same old establishment. But popular participation did not come only in the form of pressure from the outside. Brazilians were invited to send suggestions of what should be in the new constitution, and they responded to that invitation. Congress sent forms to post office across the country, which anyone could fill out and send to lawmakers, telling them what they thought was important to include in the Constitution. Historian Caroline Bauer from the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul conducted research into these demands sent by average Brazilians. She mentions that the suggestions show the taste of what the Brazilian people needed after two decades of dictatorship. People ask for something, for basic things, not suggestions of articles or something about the constitutional law, but something about education, about health, about housing, about the experience of the state-sponsored terrorism during the dictatorship, about torture. Um, about uh, hungry, about a, a, a lot of problems that people uh, experience uh, during the dictatorship. A total of 122 popular amendment bills were registered in Congress, signed by over 15 million people. It's not an overstatement to say that Brazil's 1988 constitution was not made only by experts or by political elites. It was also written by regular citizens. The new Charter of Rights brought real revolutions in terms of healthcare, pensions, welfare, and human rights. We will talk more extensively about them in the third episode of this podcast. The Constitution also changed what family means in Brazil. Up until that point, a family was strictly formed by a father, a mother, and their children. And while LGBT rights were not addressed in the 1988 Constitution, the new charter did recognize single-parent households as families. At every turn, 
We see negotiation and consensus. Pedro Abramovay recalls one iconic example. For the first time, the, the, the Brazilian constitution allows saying all power comes from the people and recognize that people could exert it directly, right? So, and, and this is not like just a symbolic change because the constitution for the first time recognized a lot of uh, direct democracy mechanism and participatory democracy mechanism in itself. And that piece was included on a bargain between like the left and the constitution and the right uh, in order to include uh, God at the preamble of the Constitution. So you're going to include uh, direct democracy uh, there, but okay, so we're going to maintain God uh, in the preamble. So this kind of bargain was done all the time. After a consensus was reached, Congress approved the federal Constitution on September 22, 1988, and the Charter was enacted on October the 5th with 64,000 words. It is the words third longest constitution only behind Nigeria's and India's. Due to its concern to human rights issues, it was nicknamed the Citizen Constitution by the House Speaker of the time, Mr. Ulysses Guimarães. É claro, promulgada. O documento da liberdade, da dignidade, da democracia, da justiça social do Brasil. Que Deus nos ajude que isto se cumpra. Like Brazil itself, the Constitution is extremely diverse and at times controversial. It is a document which undoubtedly has many flaws. The president of the time, the conservative José Sarney, said that the Constitution would create a country that is impossible to govern as it gave too many rights to too many people. But the Constitution offers a snapshot of Brazil's potential. Despite 21 years of a gruesome dictatorship, despite 80% monthly inflation, despite our disagreements, there was a time when Brazilians knew that we shared a lot of common ground, that it's possible to negotiate with people who don't think the way we do. And that's something we're lacking today. So, more than the specific articles in that text, the Constitution reminds us of the ideals we once shared as a nation, and they are pretty awesome ideals. We shouldn't lose sight of them. In the next episode, we will discuss the institutional framework created by the Constitution, our system of government, the role of the president, and the gray areas that the lawmakers of 87 and 88 left for future generations. This podcast was written by me, Gustavo Ribeiro, and produced with Diogo Rodrigues. Maria Marta Bruno was responsible for audio editing and Ewan Marshall for text editing. This is the Brazilian Constitution special podcast.